It's 1 Samuel chapter 15. Turn there in your Bibles tonight. I've been praying. I've been asking you, encouraging you, read ahead. That's how you really uh, get involved in the Bible study. I, I even think during the Bible study, when you're looking at the text and you're following along with us, it just jumps off the pages. But we come to a very sobering text here. Uh, Saul, the first king of Israel, uh, he's been on the throne. We know in chapter 13, it told us there in verse 1, uh, he's been on the throne. Uh, but he, well, he was only on the throne for, for two years, it said there. Uh, but he didn't obey the Lord. And, and that's, that's the, the lesson for us here in, in, in 1 Samuel. Especially, I told you, starting in chapters 13, 14, and 15. Saul was gifted. He was head and shoulders over everyone else. He had giftings. He had talents. Good looking. Uh, but yet he knew not the Lord. And, and if, you, if you remember our study of him, we, we, we see the hand of the Lord was upon him. God anointed him. God drew him. But he never came all in. He was always walking afar, and, and, and we saw there, in fact, look at chapter 13, verse 13, or you could put it on the screen. Uh, he was told by Samuel the prophet to wait. Uh, he was supposed to wait before he offered up the burnt offerings to the Lord, and, and we saw how he, he just, he, he's never praying to the Lord. He's never calling out to the Lord. He got nervous. Uh, he could see that the enemy, the Philistines there in chapter 13, verse 5, said there were 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, uh, army the size of the sands of the sea, uh, and, and his forces, as, as they could see the Philistines coming, they just began to just take off in, in all different ways. So we learned from those chapters, instead of calling on the Lord, he panicked. And he offered up the sacrifice himself, and he was never supposed to do that. You know, he knew, he knew according to the law, he was not to do that. And because he did that, Samuel, his friend, his mentor, verse 13 tells him, and Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandments of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over all Israel forever. He would have been that king from his line, would have come the next king. But verse 14 said, but now your kingdom shall not continue. And we read there that the Lord had sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord had commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept the Lord's command, the, Lord, the word the Lord commanded you. And so from that point on, Saul has been cut off from God. And, and, and we watched that as we, we went into chapter 14. Um, he, here's a guy, he, he never recognizes his sin. And this is important. We take heed to this tonight, saints. If you're one of those people that just, uh, it's never my fault. It's, it's this person's fault. It's that person's fault. It's my parents' fault. It's the environment. It's the environment I came from. Stop it. Stop the excuses. Saul shows us, man, you can't go on using these. Uh, in verse 11 of chapter 13, it was the people's fault. It was Samuel's fault. He never owns up to his sin. And I'm telling you, you know, I, I throw this out to you. I've been a Christian 44 years, and it is key that you constantly keep that, 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 that uh, you and the Lord, that, that, that flow going. You know, uh, Jude tells the last day's church, keep yourself in the love of God. Listen, God loves you, but you stay in that spirit of blessing. Keep the commandments of God. Follow what God says. It's, it seems so simple. But yet we're so fickle and we don't do it. And we see this in the life of Saul. He never gets it right. We never see him seeking the counsel of Samuel or, or repenting. We saw there in chapter 4, verse 3, if you remember, he's, he's got another priest now. And we learn that that priest that he went to, if you look there at verse 3 of chapter 14, it was the son of uh, a hot tub or a hot tub or whatever. But, but the name that jumps off is Ichabod's brother. The name Ichabod means the glory has departed. 
This was the son of Phineas. If you remember back in chapter 3 in our studies, Phineas and Hophni, they were the sons of Eli, the high priest, and they had departed from the Lord. And so now this, this priesthood that was disqualified is now in Saul's, he's using those people. And so we, we see here, he, he's, he's just trying to keep the show. And maybe you know what I'm talking about. You, you've probably met some Christians sometimes. They speak the Christianese, Christianese, praise the Lord, hallelujah. They may even dress, they may even put a little white thing here or, or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer. But it's all hype, it's not the real thing. And this was Saul, he was a fake, he was a phony he never was all in with the Lord. And it cost him greatly. We're going to see that. See, this is why I love it. You know, what is it? It's in Romans chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 10. It says, we study these things, the Old Testament, to warn us, to show us, to encourage us, not to go through the same things that these Guys did. I mean, his family was greatly affected because of him. His son, Jonathan, who we've watched last week, who's been the hero, we're going to see because he's connected to Saul, he's going to lose his life. Saul is going to reap the whirlwind because he never took the Lord seriously. He never took his walk with the Lord seriously. And I'm telling you, Christian, the way the currents are out there right now, you cannot be wishy-washy. You can't be putting your feet just, oh, I'm just going to touch the currents out there. Those currents will take you away. I mean, you got one of those iPhones. You're one click away from getting into all kinds of pornography, all kinds of things. They got gambling on there. I mean, it's crazy. So many things out there, so many vices that, that are trying to call us away. And so we come to chapter 15 now, and it's uh, the scene here before us. Look at verse 1. It says, Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish uh, Amalek for what he did to Israel how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them. Now this next, this is serious, man. Look what it says. But kill both man, woman, infant, nursing child, ox, sheep, camel, donkey. Wait a minute. That can't be God. Yeah, this is thus says the Lord. Verse 4, so Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telam, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. So as I pointed out earlier, scholars are, are, are not sure. We're, we're, we're really not sure the time frame from chapter 14 to chapter 15. Scholars did debate, was it 10, 15 years in between that Saul has now gone his own way? He's, he's no longer with Samuel. But now we read that Samuel hears from the Lord. The Lord tells him to go to Saul and give him this word. So in all, Saul's going to reign for 42 years. Can you imagine that? He's not God's king. He's not God's man, but yet he's going to be in place there for 42 years. But here's what I want you to see here is, once again, God is reaching out to Saul. You, you, you can't miss this. God is trying to get his attention. Once again, what if it's be it 10, 15 years later, still God is trying to get his attention. Now he sends Samuel back into his life now. He's reaching out to him and he's reminding him. Look at verse one again. The Lord sent me. He, Samuel's telling him, the Lord sent me. Notice it's L-O-R-D, capitals, Yahweh. Jehovah, Jehovah cares about you, Saul. And he sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, heed the voice of the word of the Lord. Maybe God is saying that to some of us here tonight. 
The Lord again is speaking to you. The Lord is trying to appeal to you tonight and he's, he's seeking to draw your attention and he would say to you, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Again, God has already told Samuel that night before that Saul would, would, would come before him and he would be the next king of Israel. And, and then there was these series of happenings. I, I mean, you know, I'm speaking here about how Saul could, could miss it, God and his presence and God's calling upon his life. I mean, way back there in chapter 10, verse 1, it said there, it is not because the Lord has anointed, uh, it, is, it is not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance. And he explained there in verses two to eight what he could expect and, 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 and what God was going to do. And God's going to send two men and they're going to talk to you and, and they're, they're, they're going to meet you at Rachel's tomb. And everything God, that the man of God said, Samuel said to him, it came to pass. He told them, your father's donkeys are going to be fine. Verse three, he told them there uh, that, that uh, the, the, uh, you're going to head towards Tabor and three men will greet you and they're going to give you two loaves of bread and all these things happen. Then he'd go to, uh, in verse five, to the Philistine garrison and there he would find a group of prophets and they would be testifying and they would begin to pray over Saul. And verse six, put it on the screen. Look what the Lord said. Samuel told Saul here, then the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Let it be known when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands for God is with you. He was telling him, God's gonna do all these things to you and God did it to him. Why are you telling us this, Bob? Because isn't that your story? I mean, that's my story. The moment I got saved, man, it was like the Lord was just bringing people into my life. And I started meeting people. I started putting on the radio and I'm hearing Bible verses that, that I heard the night before. Or, or lot. God was just speaking to me. It was just so profound. But I found myself like Saul. Could this be real? Is this really happening? Is God really real? Does he really love me like this? Does he really have a plan for me? And I know for me, there was about two years of just going back and forth, back and forth. And this has been Saul. Saul had never taken seriously his calling. He never took heed to the words of the Lord. When God said to him, look at chapter 12, verse 14. Through Samuel, Samuel told him, if you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice, and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. Great blessing was going to come to you, Saul, if you took heed to him. And he went on to say in verse 15, however, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your father. Again, it comes down to choose you this day. Who are you going to choose? Am I going to follow the Lord? Or am I going to keep on going with my flesh and going and doing whatever my flesh tells me to do? I mean, it gets old pretty fast. I know for me, it got real old. But we have a choice. Are we going to heed the voice of the Lord? Or are we going to continue on in the flesh and just try to satisfy this flesh? Samuel reaches out to him and tells him, look at verse three, go back to verse three. Now go, he tells him, listen, this is what the Lord's telling you, Saul. Attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant, nursing child, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. Wipe them out. God was very precise here. In fact, seven times in this text, he uses that phrase, especially in the Hebrew, Utterly destroy them. Get rid of them. Now back in chapter 14, verse 48, if you look up there, we reread there earlier that Saul had previously attacked them and delivered Israel from their, from their hands. But now God was commanding their annihilation. And it's verses like that. I, I, I know for, for, for many of you, if, if this is the first time you're sitting and you're reading this and you're going, is this for real? 
is this for real? Is, is this the God who created the heavens and the earth? Is this is what God is saying to us? See, it's verses like this that cause people to say, I don't like this. This God of the Old Testament, he's, he's rash. He's, 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 he, we, we use words like wicked, uncaring, but be careful. Be careful when you begin to question and characterize God in the wrong light. Because God is good. And God is all wise and God is perfect in his wisdom. Romans 11, 33, New Testament. Paul tells us there his ways are perfect. His, his wisdom is beyond our finding out. In Isaiah 50, it's there where the Lord says to his people, my ways are higher than your ways. My ways are not your ways. But my ways are perfect. Check yourself when you find yourself questioning God, questioning his purpose, questioning his plan. I want you to know if you just do a little quick read, the history of Amalek and the people of Amalek, they were the descendants of Esau. If you know anything, this is why it's so good to know the whole Bible. There were, Esau, there were two sons of Jacob, Esau, or Esau and Jacob. They were the sons of Isaac. And they were two different sons. Esau wanted nothing to do with God. And Jacob was the son that wanted God, was drawn after God, followed God. And God blessed him. But Esau and his descendants wanted nothing. He actually sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. I mean, I hope it was a good bowl of stew because he sold his whole birthright. But some, listen, we laugh at that, but some of us sell ourselves cheaper. We give ourselves to sin, to certain things, and, and we're, we're selling ourselves cheap. So his descendants now who dwelt south of Judea in the Sinai region there of Negev, they were a nomadic people. They were marauders. These were people, they, they were like ISIS, this, this whole group here, constantly attacking, constantly oppressing, especially the people of God. We read about them in Genesis, but we also read in Exodus 17. You, can, you could read there about them 400 years previously. Now put that, make a note of that. 400 years, these people viciously attacked God's people. God had sovereignly opened up the Red Sea. He had brought his people from Egypt into Canaan. Everybody knew at this time, these people are the people of God. God is with these people. Some two, three million people, God supernaturally brought them from Egypt, destroyed the Egyptian army at this time. And here they are dwelling in the, in the, in the wilderness. Put, put Deuteronomy 25, 17. God tells Israel there, remember what Amalek, the, the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and cut off all who were lagging behind. Who's, who usually lags behind? You're talking the old people, the nursing moms. And it says, verse 19, when the Lord your God gives you rest from all your enemies around you in the land he is giving you to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek. From under heaven, do not forget. God told his people there, don't forget this, what they did. They had no fear of God, these people. In fact, archaeologists who have uncovered and, and, and did details upon these people, they were involved with perverse practices, uh, incense, bestiality, uh, sacrificing their children, brutal, torturous people. And yet, listen, look at the grace of God here. God gave him 400 years to repent. Get right, get right, get right. They're seeing uh, Jericho. They're seeing uh, God's people blessed as they're going into, into the land. They had so many signs of God, but they put it off. But in all this time, they never repented. So the Bible speaks of the cup of the wrath of God, God's final judgment. When God says enough, and I want you to know, there comes a time for every person, every nation. God has made himself known. God is revealing himself to you. And you have a choice. I mean, here in America, uh, you're in trouble. 
You, we, we have too much evidence. We have too much witness of God to ignore it. And this is why Peter, he, he tells the last day's church in 2 Peter 3, 9, he says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you. Look at this. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's God. God is good. God is kind. God is love. But if you're going to continue to harden yourself and you're going to continue to give yourself over to sin, and God who knows the end from the beginning, he knows the person's heart. I hear people say that to me all the time. Oh, but God knows my heart. He knows your heart. It's wicked. It's not good. Listen, listen, put it on the screen, Galatians 6, 7. Look what Paul says to, to, to the church, he says this to, because judgment begins in the house of God. He says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man, a woman reaps what they sow. The one who sows to please the sinful nature from that nature will reap dis destruction. But the one who sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Again, everyone has a choice. To recognize God, to call upon the Lord, to have his spirit reigning in you, empowering you to say no to sin. But sadly, too many, too many. What did Jesus tell us in Matthew 7? The road to destruction is broad and wide and many are upon it. But few are on that narrow road. But don't miss this. Here is Saul now. Saul has another opportunity here. I believe again, all right, he, he couldn't be the king, but, but now I, I really believe if he called out to God and repented, God would have helped him. Maybe he wouldn't let him continue to be the king, but he, he could be the man of God, that, that God could raise him up and use his life. It's never over for God. Wherever you are in your walk with the Lord, it's never over. He wishes none to perish, all to have eternal life. He wants us to obey his voice, but like many today who hear the commands of God, God's word is so clear. God lets us know. He tells us, man, obey me, follow me. Well, I don't know. I, I'll follow commandment number four, number five, maybe number six. I don't know about 10, coveting. We, we, we pick and choose sexual immorality. Bible's clear, don't have sex until you're married. But people balk at that. That's archaic. Are you serious? Come on. It's interesting, when you go in the New Testament, when they break down what we're going to believe and what we're not going to believe, that's, that's one of the main ones. Do not, do not commit sexual immorality. We live in a world today that says homosexuality. Come on, Bob, these people love each other. But God says it's wrong. God says it's wrong. God, who is all wise, all perfect, all knowledge, but yet we question God. God, we question his word. We need to stop it. We need to stop it. But like Saul, we pick and choose what we're going to believe and what we're going to obey. And this lesson before us today is a warning to wake up. In fact, go down, go down to verse 22. This is the point of the message right here. Verse 22, down in the bottom. Behold, behold, Samuel's gonna tell him, to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than religion. You know, some of us, we think, well, hey, Bob, I come on Wednesday night. I don't just come Sunday. I come Wednesday. I'm one of the Wednesday nighters. I'm not one of the second service Sunday people. No, they're, they're good too. He said, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams for rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. I mean, he's saying, well, witchcraft's bad. But he's saying by us being disobedient, it's, it's just as bad as witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity of idolatry. Your stubborn heart, your half-heartedness. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Stop playing with God's word. Obey him. Stop picking and choosing what you're going to believe. God will not be mocked. He's not going to be snared at. 
I always think of Genesis 6, 3, right before the flood. What, what does the, the Lord say there? That, the, that, that God's spirit will not strive with man forever. There comes a point where God says, that's enough. That's enough. You've received enough clarity and you did nothing with it. This is what we see here in chapter 15. God saying to the Amalekites and to Saul, enough. God is is now enacting judgment upon these people. Just as he did with Adam and Eve. If you remember in the garden. God told them, the day you eat of that fruit, you shall surely die. Now, when they ate the fruit, did they die right away? No. But they eventually died. But again, we see the grace of God even in that. God didn't let them die. God forgave them. God graced them. God covered them. He, 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 he took a lamb and he slaughtered it and covered them with the clothes of the lamb. See, the Bible is so clear. When it says the wages of sin is death, it means what it says. Sin brings death. But if we will turn to him, if we will seek his face, he'd heal us, he'd forgive us, he'd bless us. But if you continue to harden your heart and continue in that sin as Saul did and as the Amalekites did, you will eventually reap destruction. See, I, 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 I'm not, listen, this is not my favorite places to preach from. I want you to know that. You know, I, I mean, these things are hard sayings, but, but this is the truth. See, God is such a loving father. He knows those things will destroy you. Oh, are you, why can't I drink? See, thank God I had a father who was an alcoholic. I didn't want anything to do with drinking. I had a lot of other problems and a lot of other sins. But by the grace of God, I'm telling you, he's real. 19 years old, he saved me. It's real. Listen, draw to the Lord. Judgment's going to come. There's, there's a verse in Genesis 18, 25 when, 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 when Abraham says there, will not the judge of all the earth do right? He actually said that when God came to him, God came to him. Actually, there's theologians that believe it was actually Christ. It's called the theophany in, in the Old Testament where it was Christ and two angels. They come to Abraham and they tell him, how they're going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's the first thing that Abraham says, will not the judge of all the earth do right? And it bothered him. He's like, oh, Lord. He's, he's actually debating with God. God, if there's a if there's hundred righteous men, would you, would, you, would you put off judgment? And God says, yeah, for a hundred people. They get it all the way down to five. But God couldn't even find five people righteous there in Sodom and Gomorrah. And the fire came. And it's interesting. I, I don't know if I, I had you guys put it in, but in Ezekiel chapter 16, 49, do you have it? They do have it. Put it up there. Basically, when it talks about the sin of Sodom, we, th- we think of that, that, that great sin. They were committing that abomination, homosexuality. But it goes on to say there that they were arrogant, overfed, unconcerned, and haughty. Who does that sound like? See, they were just like us, and judgment came. So let's go back to our text, verse (laughs) 6. It says, Then Saul said to the Canaanites, the Kenites, Go, depart, get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. I'm sure they took off. But these are an interesting group, the the. The Kenites here, they were actually the descendants of Jethro. Jethro from Pentecost Junction. No, Jethro. <laughs> Jethro was, was, was the father-in-law of Moses. you got to make this light. Uh, he, his daughter Zipporah married Moses, and, and they were just kind. The, the people were so good to the children of Israel. In fact, when, when Joshua was co- going into the land, they were there with them, and he was like, stay with us. But, but what I like about the, the Kenites here is they're a great picture of the church, how God always saves his church, his remnant from judgment. As judgment is going to befall a people, a nation, God always has a remnant that he supernaturally takes out. You see it throughout the scriptures. You see it with Noah and his family. As God was going to bring judgment, he saved Noah and his family. 
Lot and his family, they were saved from the judgment that came upon Sodom. And the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us, that we who believe in him, that he hasn't appointed us to wrath, but that before judgment comes, before that great tribulation comes, that seven-year tribulation that's talked about in Revelations, God is going to supernaturally take his people out of this. That's why I thought tonight would be a good night for it to happen. Boom. Why am I still here? No. But God, I, you know, this is also a good message for us to come out from the world. Its ways and following its practice. We, we shouldn't be valuing what they value. You know, when, when I study Sodom and Gomorrah, when I, I looked at that, that, that whole lot, when, when Lot and his family are, are living there, it, it, it's an interesting read because he says, okay, uh, you know, when him and Abraham are figuring out which way you're going to go, right or left, he says, I'll go, I'll go right because I love the fields. Look at that, the, the fields of Sodom. Boy, I can make a lot of money there. You, could, might, you might make a lot of money there, but the people were wicked people. And you see this. And, and then you see where, where Lot's not only outside the city, he's eventually in the city. Then you see him at the very gates of the city, meaning he was part of the government there. And not only was he so much a part of it, there's a scene when these angels come and tell Lot, okay, we got to take you and your family. You got to get out of here. God's wrath's coming upon it. And the people, the men of the city, begin to bang on the door. Send those two angels out. Well, they thought they were men. Send those two men out. We want to have sexual relationships with them. And listen to what Lot says. I got two virgin daughters. I'll send them out. I mean, how would you like that if you were, that was your father. You, I'll throw you out the door, dad. I mean, but, but, this, but this is where you got to remind yourself, Peter, I believe it's in 2 Peter, he calls him righteous Lot three times. That he was a righteous man, but he was vexed because of the, the town he was living in. I think this is good advice. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and I will be a father unto you. You will be my sons and daughters. Verse 7, then Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. Uh, Agag is not his name. It's like a name like president or pharaoh. But he takes this Agag, Agag the king, as a prisoner and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But look at verse 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. Now, do you remember last week in our study where Saul was saying to his son Jonathan, You're, you have to die because I gave a vow and you broke that vow. He was ready to have his son killed. But now he's sparing this king. This is where, where, where you're looking like, what, what, this guy, his thinking is, is it's out of whack. It says that was good. And we're unwilling, mark that, and we're unwilling to utterly destroy them as God told them to. But everything despised, worthless, they utterly destroyed. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret, mark that, that I have set up Saul as king. For he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. I just always see that when you and I sin, it just doesn't just affect you. It affects other people. And in this case, it affected Samuel and it affected the country and affected God. God was grieved. Verse 12, so when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told, or, or it was told, Samuel saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed, look what this guy does. He set up a monument of himself. Can, I could see him posing for it. That's right, get it right. He's posing for pictures. And he has gone on around and passed by and gone down to Gilgal. I mean, this guy, first of all, he didn't do everything God told him to do. He partially obeyed the Lord. 
And now he's making monuments of himself. It's interesting if you're taking note. Exodus, Exodus 17, 15, when Moses defeated the Amalekites, it tells us there that he built an altar unto the Lord. And he called it there, the Lord is my banner, or Jehovah Nisi. This is the Lord. The Lord did this. Notice the difference between Moses and Saul. Moses was, the Lord did it. All glory to the Lord. Here's, here's, here's Saul. Look what I did. Give me a statue. Saul is just full of himself here. He's got this big army now that's fighting for him. And so he, he does what he wants to do. Verse 8. And he also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. Again, I, I read this. This is all selective obedience. Don't miss that here. God told Saul to wipe them all out. But notice verse 9. It says, he, along with the Israelites, were unwilling. That word there in the Hebrew is saying, it's not saying they forgot or they weren't sure. It's saying they refused. In fact, the King James is stronger. It said he would not. They would not. They refused. See, here they figured they knew better than God. Just like many of us today, we balk at the commands of God. We ignore them. Don't get drunk. We get drunk. Don't gamble. We gamble. We know better than God. It's interesting in Isaiah 5, 20, Isaiah says of the people of his day, he says, Woe are those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. It's an evil world that tells us today that, you know, and, and I'm not coming down just on homosexuals. I want you to know I love homosexuals. I, I really do. I, I, my heart breaks for them. I think you've heard my story before. The first three years I worked in the prison, I worked in a unit, C unit, that was just strictly homosexuals, and I heard all their stories. And over those three years, I, had, I loved these people. But that whole lifestyle is destructive. The stuff they're feeding, it, it breaks my heart. I had a mom in my office this week whose daughter's 21, showed me a picture of a beautiful girl. And now she's, she's thinking she's, she's a man and she wants to disfigure her whole body and she's starting to take these medications. Again, destructive. And all this is sin and it leads to heartache and hardship and emptiness. And it goes back to what God says to his people. There's a way that seems right to a man and a woman, but it leads to destruction. And God tells us a way and God lovingly shows us his way and we Balk at it. And this is what we see here. You know, I, I could see the time is going, but, but, but those of you who studied this scene, why is God being so hard? Why is God saying, no, Saul, listen to me. You've got to destroy them all. You want to know why he tells Saul this? Because, Lord willing, I hope we're, we're not here for 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10. I hope we're in heaven and Samuel himself will give you the Bible study. But in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10, it tells us there, you know who kills Saul? An Amalekite. Amalekite finishes him off. He falls on his sword and he's not dead. And 2 Samuel chapter 1, 10, you could read it himself. That's what kills him. Why did God say to destroy those people? Because uh, and, and these, this same group of people will give all kinds of problems for David and, and, and the people of Israel. 200 years later, an Amalekite by the name of Haman will seek to destroy God's people in the book of Esther. Why does God tell his people, do what I say? Because he knows. He knows the end from the beginning. And this is a lesson for us, the church. When the Bible tells us to mortify the flesh or crucify the flesh, put it to death. It uses these strong words because, again, this flesh wants its own way. You know, uh, my grandson, I love him. I love Noah. Boys are so much different than girls. I raised three daughters. Boys are crazy. <laughs> and, and, and Noah, I, I look at him and he's just like me. 
He's just like, he'll take a, a rock and he'll throw it right through a window and just, what do you think, Papa? Like he, he's, you know, and, and, and so again, that flesh, you, you, you're, you're just so, you want to, you know, and I could see it and I'm praying for him because I'm like, oh, Noah, you're going to find out the hard way. God help us. You know, there's another thing I see here in verse 13. Notice how your sin will always find you out. Look at verse 13. It says, then Samuel went to Saul and said, and Saul said to him, blessed are you of the Lord. Look at the Christian stuff he's talking. I've performed the commandments of the Lord. But you, but verse 14, but Samuel said, what then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowering of the oxen which I hear? He can hear the cows. He, the bleeping of the sheep. Where did these all come from? Your sin will find you out. There's a great verse, Numbers 32, 23. It tells us there, be sure your sin will find you out. We see here, even in this case, boy, you, Saul couldn't even hide it. He couldn't even hide it. Again, God help him. But Samuel knew. Notice how, how Saul tries to put the, the blame on the people here. Look at verse 15. And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. It, it, it was the people. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen. It sounds like just like in the garden, right? Remember? Adam, what did you do? It wasn't me. It was Eve. And then Eve. It wasn't me. It was the snake. We're, we're, we're so quick to blame the next person. Lord, your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet, and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. Saul had no fear of God here. He couldn't even see how wrong he was. You know, well, I, I, I followed the Lord most of the way. I, I was loyal. I was loyal 90% of it. 96%, Lord. I dare, I dare a husband to tell their wife, I, I was 96% faithful to you. <laughs> God help you. But God places this text before us to warn us. Sin, any sin, not ruthlessly dealt with will destroy you. Not only will it destroy you, it will destroy your family and those around you. See, I think I have it written down here. Yeah, put it up, Hebrews 3.13, or actually Hebrews 3.12. Look what it tells us there. The writer of Hebrews says, Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you with an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it's called today. Listen, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. That word deceitful means you're going to be deceived by sin. And sin comes and it, and, and it looks good. I can't tell you how many times in my 30 years as a pastor that I sat down and I would look at this people and I'd say, listen, you're, you're, you're going to lose your whole family. You're, what you're doing is wrong. And they'll look at me defiantly and say, but pastor, I have the peace of God. I have the peace of God. God's with me. I'm okay with this. We're cool with this. And I'm thinking, oh, you're not going to a cool place. God help you. Again, so many people, we flirt with sin. That drug, you know, we think it's not going to enslave me. That pornography, it's not going to bother me. I mean, I see Agag. He's all chained up. Look, we got him chained. He can't harm me. That sin will destroy you. How could you say that, Bob? Because I worked in the prison system for 25 years and I saw good men, good women. None of them wanted to be prostitutes. None of them wanted that life of sin. But because they flirted with sin, it consumed them. Oh, Bob, come on. It won't happen to me. Famous last words. God help us. But Saul was so proud. Verse 17 so Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, he's speaking to Saul here, were you not head of the tribes of Israel and did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Can I tell you that is, I love that verse. 
because I remind myself all the time that when you were small, when you started out, you were small in your own eyes. It's so important to stay small in your own eyes. God needs to be magnified. God, you, God needs to be everything. I'm here to tell you, I've been a Christian 44 years. I need God more than I ever needed him before. You stay needing on the Lord. Verse 18, now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Mark that. God saw it as evil. What you think is, oh, it's an affair. We're having an affair. I, I love the words of Joseph when, 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 when the, the, the uh, what's his name's wife was after him every day. What was his name? Potiphar. Potiphar. Every day. I mean, this is a victorious secret model. She's coming out to him every day because, you know, he's rich. He's famous. He's, he's got a beautiful girl. And Joseph, lay with me. Joseph, lay with me. And what does Joseph say? How can I do such wickedness against God? Because he knew God was going to see it. God sees everything. Verse 20, and Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and I've gone on a mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. I mean, this guy, he's, he doesn't get it. He goes blaming others. Verse 21. But the people took the plunder, the sheep, the oxen, the beast, uh, the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Did you catch that? Go back to verse 21. But the Lord took of the plunder, sheep, oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Saul. He's not your God. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, God was never his God. Verse 22. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as, does the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? There it is. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as the iniquity of idolatry. Because you have, you've rejected the word of the Lord. And he also has rejected you from being king. God takes all forms of sin seriously. Rebellion is as witchcraft. Stubbornness as idolatry. Stop rejecting the word of God. God wants us to obey him. Not to just go through the motions of rebellion. Not just to go through religious experience. Oh, Lord, look, did you see me go to church Wednesday? Did you see me go Friday? You know, we, we think sometimes God should just be pleased with my devotional service, my tithe. See, this was Israel throughout the scriptures. Look at us, Lord, we're sacrificing. Lord, look at our worship. Look at the tabernacle. Look at the songs that are coming out of it. Listen to what God says in Isaiah 1.11. What makes you think I want all your sacrifices, says the Lord. I'm sick of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fatted cattle. I get no pleasure from the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to worship me, who asked you to parade through my courts with all your ceremony? Stop bringing me your meaningless gifts and the incense of your offerings. They disgust me. Wow, God, tell me what you really think. Look at verse 15. When you lift your hands in prayer, I will not look. Though you offer many prayers, I will not listen, for your hands are covered with the blood of innocent victims. Wash yourselves and be clean. Get your sin out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. Learn to do good. And it's interesting, down in verse 8, down in verse 8, after God slams his people and they deserved it, look what he says. But come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Or come now, let's reason together. Is God good or what? Despite all the crud, he says, come on. 
Let's reason together. Though your sins are scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. Though they're red as crimson, I'll make them white as wool. If you will only obey me, you will have plenty to eat. But if you turn away and refuse to listen, you will be devoured by the sword of your enemies. I, the Lord, have spoken. Just do what's right. Love me. Love me. Saul missed it. Verse 24, then, and I've got to get the worship team up here. I stayed at a time. Verse 24, then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I've, I've transgressed the commandments of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed the voice. It's, it's not really even real repentance. Look at verse 25. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. Basically, he's saying, listen, OK, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But just come with me, Samuel. This looks good. You're back. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of the robe, tore it. And so Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor of yours who is better than you. And that was speaking of David. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he, has not, for, for he is not a man that he should relent. Like God's not going to change his mind here. And then he said, I've sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of the people and before Israel and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. There it is. Not my God, your God. It's all about looks. I want to look right. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. And this will be the course of Saul's life for the next 20, 30 years as we go through this pride, half-heartedness, never repenting, bitter, just going through the motions, hating and despising David. He'll miss, he'll miss Samuel. He'll miss that relationship. In fact, he'll miss it so much in chapter 28, he'll... He'll use a, a witch to contact Samuel when he dies. Again, so lost. What does this chapter tell us? I think it tells me, get serious. Get serious about your walk with the Lord. Not to, you know, to, to, to see what God sees. If God says it's sin, it's sin. Don't fight with God. Turn to the Lord. Yield your life to him. Repent. Repent. What is repentance? Repentance is such a good word because it basically means whatever has your attention, turn it back onto Jesus. Go back to Jesus. Metanoia. Rethink. Turn back to the Lord. Father in heaven, Lord, this, this is heavy, heavy, heavy stuff here, Lord. But it's your word and it doesn't return void. And you say that it carries out what it's meant to do. And I believe you're raising up Davids here today, Lord. You're raising up Esthers, Lord. Rahabs, Rebecca's, Lord. Ruth's, those who love you and, and love your kingdom and love you, Lord. And so I just pray, Father. I pray tonight as we, we, we look at the example of Saul tonight and, and something within us that sin that so easily snares us, Lord, that we would see that that sin's not little. That sin that we do could be just watching something. It could be a lie here and there, you know, stealing this here and there. Lord, that has the potential to bite us, to destroy us, to ruin our, our walk. So I pray, I pray today that we would, we would just bring it to the altar. Instead of building a monument of ourselves, look how great I am. Let's just build an altar. Let's go to the altar. As Abraham and Moses used to make these altars, they would have encounters with you. And they would leave those encounters seeing you bigger and seeing you so wise, so loving, Lord. I pray, I pray tonight that our thinking will change, that we'll realize, wow, God says no to this because he loves me. He knows those things have the potential to destroy me. 
So Lord, we give heed to you tonight. We turn to you. Let this song be a prayer to us tonight. This song, I need you. I need you every hour, Lord. (laughs) What a great song to end with. This is my song. This is our song. We need you, Lord. Let's sing it. Let's sing it together. Let's ask him to come down and remove whatever that sin is tonight.